Hello, uh, my name is Berat Bareni and I'm an associate professor with the School of Mechatronic Systems Engineering at Simon Fraser University in BC, Canada. Uh, today I'm going to talk about smart textiles covering their applications, definitions and uh, uh, some of the recent developments in the field. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Anil Roy for inviting me to give this talk and as the uh, chair for the Vancouver section uh, in, uh, of the uh, IEEE Sensors Council chapter, uh, I think this is a great idea holding these winter schools or similar schools. And I'm gonna take this back as a learning opportunity myself to uh, our uh, chapter. So at SFU, I uh, manage uh, a research lab named the Intelligent Sensing Laboratory uh, that I founded when I joined SFU in 2008. Uh, our research focus is the development of sensors and sensing systems, and we cover every aspect that is related to sensing from material side all the way to signal processing. Uh, we have been fortunate enough to raise over $9 million of funding over the past decade, and our results uh, the results of our research have been published in more than 100 papers in various journals and conferences. Uh, most of the work that we do is in collaboration with companies and government organizations with uh, practical applications in mind. Um, so here is uh, the official photo of me. And as you notice, by comparing the photo and the live video, uh, I need to take a new one. And that was supposed to happen just before the COVID. But for now, uh, just accept that as who I was a, a few years ago. And I'm going to turn off the video for the rest of this presentation so that we can save on bandwidth a little bit and hopefully avoid distraction at the same time. Here is the outline of the presentation. I'm going to, uh, first of all, introduce the smart textiles. You know, when we call a piece of textile to be smart, then I'll talk about applications. And uh, through that, we'll talk about manufacturing methods and how we make uh, different types of sensors or actuators on small textiles. Uh, I'll talk about three case studies from my own research lab and labs of my uh, colleagues in BC on small textile, actually different applications with different perspectives. And then the presentation ends with challenges and outlooks in the field. So what are small textiles? Uh, we call a piece of textile to be smart if it reacts to the changes in the environment or to the commands from a uh, control unit. So it's not a passive piece of uh, material anymore. It actually is responsive. What does it respond to? The stimuli can be thermal, chemical, optical, mechanical, uh, electrical, and others. And how does it respond? It could respond uh, as a change in material properties, as a change in color, electrical properties, uh, etc. cetera. And uh, sometimes you actually don't notice a change in the, device, the material properties or, or anything in textile, but it collects data and provides it to a unit that can actually process that data and use it. Here are the main application areas for small textile. Uh, interestingly, fashion is at the top of the list. It has been the case for uh, decades, actually. Uh, but using uh, filaments other than wool or cotton in textile actually dates back to uh, the times of uh, Egyptians and maybe even before, where people incorporated pieces of gold or threads of gold in their clothing uh, as a symbol of uh, wealth and uh, stature in the society. Nowadays, we can do the same. We can uh, incorporate uh, you know, all sorts of these interesting filaments and materials into textile with the goal of making something fashionable. And that could be you know, something that changes on the fly or responds to the environment uh, and so on and so forth. The military is another major application area. And here the demand is on, for example, to monitor the soldier in terms of you know, fatigue and other physiological parameters that are important in terms of uh, their optimum performance. Uh, it could be for the detection of chemicals in an environment. Uh, in case uh, you want to detect a hazardous situation, you can detect loads on the soldier. And also you can use the textile 
as an interface between the soldier and the computer they're carrying. Um, sports and fitness is another relatively obvious application area. In here, you use the smart textile to interact with the, uh, with the body of the uh, person in order to track their activities or even figure out uh, what movements are done perfectly and what, which ones need improvement. Uh, transportation is another application area. So here is an inside of a car. And as you can see, we have numerous applications for textile here uh, from seat belts to seat coverings. And uh, the small textile application in here could be to monitor the loads, to monitor the temperature, occupant detection, and so on. Uh, and obviously, you know, same kind of applications apply to medical field where you use uh, different types of sensors to monitor different activities. In particular case shown here, you may, for example, want to use accelerometers in order to prevent or, or at least detect falls, uh, which is important, especially in the elderly population. And then architecture is where you use smart textile in order to uh, bring new design elements to your uh, infrastructure and make the, maybe uh, just make them variable or fashionable or responsive to the changes uh, that are happening in the environment. So, for example, you can, for example, uh, monitor the temperature and humidity variations inside a building using textile that you use for drapes. So, um, here is a global market analysis by application by, from Technavio. Uh, and as you can see, the range or the market share for each one of these applications that I mentioned uh, ranges somewhere from about 9% to 25%. And that's quite a fair uh, distribution between these different application areas. Or in other words, all of them are really important. So if you have an idea that is applicable to one of these um, application areas, that represents a significant market, as I'm going to show you on the next slide. And uh, this is a global market for smart textiles by region. Um, as you can see, you know, depending on whom you ask, of course, uh, the current market size is somewhere around three to five billion dollars for smart textiles, and this is expected to uh, almost double in in a matter of three to four years. Uh, presently, North America and Europe are the largest markets for smart textiles, but as you can see, in a few years. Uh, Asia Pacific is going to pass them in terms of the market size. At least past Europe, but most likely North America soon after that. So, um, depending on the application, a smart textile system uh, can be passive, where it just reacts automatically to something that is happening in the environment or changes something in response to, to a uh, variation in environmental parameters. It could be active where it actually receives a command and acts based on uh, a command that comes from somewhere else. It could be an electrical command, for example, for uh, changing the color of a portion of the textile. Or it could be intelligent where it looks at the environment and monitors the changes in the environment and then decides well, how to act and how or how to react based on that data. And these intelligent textile systems obviously need some processing power that is embedded with them. Uh, such smart textile systems therefore need a combination of these components that are listed below. You need to have sensors in order to figure out what is going in the, in the, in the environment. Uh, you need to have actuators in order to be able to respond to those changes. You need to have interconnects to take the data from your sensor side to your processor side and the processor to analyze the data that is collected by these sensors. You need to have some communication capabilities in some cases because you want to transmit the data, for example, your fitness data or biomedical data to a remote system for monitoring and tracking. And finally, in many cases, you also need to uh, worry about an energy source, especially if uh, you want to do these uh, calculations or, or operations in electrical domain, you need to have a battery or some sort of an energy harvester to provide the energy that you need for those operations. A smart textile system at the very least usually have uh, the sensor or the actuator part, but nowadays we're moving 
towards uh, applications where more and more of these functions are integrated into the uh, smart text stack. So a distinction is sometimes made between uh, smart text styles and e-text styles. Uh, so an e-text style is a an electronic system that is embedded within a text file structure. So going back to the definition of smart text style that we had, uh, for a smart text style, there's really no requirement for even generation of an electrical signal or, or responding to an electrical uh, input. An electronic text style is therefore a subset of smart text styles where you have an electrical interface, either at the input for your actuators or at the output for your sensors. And there has been uh, work to actually integrate even more functions into text styles, use the entire text style uh, as a, uh, you know, LM transducer, as well as computing and maybe even communications. Um, the most, why are we focusing on e-text styles? The reason is that at uh, present, uh, the most convenient way of processing information is to do it in electrical domain. We convert them in most cases into digital signals and can do all sorts of uh, fancy signal processing on them. Uh, and for that reason, uh, if a device is, uh, has an electrical port, uh, it makes working with it easier for us. It makes the interfacing easier for us. Um, text styles with electrical, let's say, uh, properties uh, have been around for a very long time. So here shown is a, a piece of text style with uh, embroidery. This is known as Zarduzi in, uh, you know, in India and Iran and that part of the world where people take filaments of gold and uh, create these patterns on textile. And uh, as, you know, as, as soon as you have gold on a piece of textile, you have electrical conduction. So obviously we haven't been using it uh, for that kind of an application over the past few centuries. But what I'm trying to say here is that the capabilities for at least using this textile as a uh, substrate for developing new um, electrical systems have been there. And uh, the interesting fact is that the intentional use of these conductive fabrics in textile, uh, or the idea of it, or actually even the practice of it, is almost as old as, old as the uh, field of electrical engineering itself. The first electrical engineering school was established in 1882, and the first use of uh, uh, this textile, this uh, textile with uh, conductive filaments for fashion was actually in 1884, where they had illuminated girls that had these dresses with embedded uh, light sources in them, and they could be hired to, for example, serve in different parties. Uh, so that goes back to 1884. Uh, moving a, a little bit ahead, you know, maybe one century ahead, in 1968, there was ideas about uh, using these conductive filaments in your clothing in order to um, use electricity to heat it up. So this could be a warm piece of clothing. You can consider this to be a smart textile because it is taking a command from, uh, let's say, an electrical system. Uh, well, things have improved since then. And uh, nowadays, uh, or not nowadays, actually, this is a few years back, uh, we have found ways to incorporate conductive lines in a more controlled manner here and do more with them. Now you can see there is a microprocessor that is attached to the textile. You have sensors and you have LEDs that you can use for uh, medical applications or for display applications. And, uh, you know, even if you go a little bit further, now this is a connected mask from a Canadian company, Mayant, uh, that is um, smart. You know, the mask itself is taking measurements of your respiratory behavior, and it also is in, uh, uh, incorporating some Bluetooth uh, capabilities for transferring that information to, let's say, a mobile device or a computer. So it keeps track of your breath and your vital parameters over time. Well, to integrate uh, the electronics and transducers onto a smart textile, there are different approaches. Uh, I would say the easiest one, the one that everybody started with, was to use detachable modules that you could attach and detach from the, the textile. And these modules contained all those pieces that 
uh, for example, could not survive the washing and drying cycles or the battery that had to be charged or replaced. Uh, so this is the easiest way of doing it, but uh, obviously, uh, in terms of use uh, cases, this is not that desired. Uh, the second category would be to use embedded electronics and transducers. These uh, are now part of the textile, and if you want to remove them, you will essentially destroy the textile. Uh, most often we have a mixed method where you have some sensors or transducers that are embedded within the textile plus some detachable components like the battery or communication modules or the processors that are needed to uh, locally uh, interpret the data collected by the transducers. And uh, intelligent textile uh, is uh, a platform that we're moving towards or we're hoping to move towards where uh, all of these components are integrated into textile and we produce the energy from the textile, we uh, collect data using the textile, apply commands that you would like through the textile, and then maybe process the data uh, locally as well. Um, so we are still not there, but there's a lot of research opportunities to, more, uh, to, to move towards that uh, goal. Um, I am showing you two examples from two Canadian companies here, Mayant, uh, the skin product from Mayant, and uh, Hexoskin from, uh, sorry, uh, Asperskin from Hexoskin. These are two Canadian companies in Toronto and Montreal. Uh, and uh, as you can see, both of them uh, take this mixed approach. And you have a battery and processor module that is attached or detached to these uh, uh, smart textile or clothing based on smart textile, but then the textile itself has a number of discrete sensors as well as sensors that are integrated into the fabric. It, on the type of materials you use in smart textiles depends on the application. Uh, as we mentioned before, um, it is usually more convenient for us to do all the processing in electrical domain. So in a lot of cases, we would like to have conductive threads. In this case, you know, electrically conductive is uh, meant. Uh, how do we make them? Uh, you can use all sorts of conductive materials and come up with different ways to coat the yarns or functionalize the yarns uh, with these materials. Uh, you can use metal fibers uh, outright and then create uh, thin uh, fibers and threads based on them that you can incorporate into textile. Uh, you can coat uh, yarn that is otherwise insulating with uh, conducting materials and therefore give it conductive properties. Uh, this could be done to polymers and various natural uh, fibers. Uh, we can have conductive composites. These are in most cases nanoparticles that we add to host uh, polymers in order to make the polymer conductive. And you can also use polymers that are inherently conductive, and then these can be used uh, as part of the textile. In many cases, you may need to uh, add some strength or durability, or maybe just anchor points to your textiles, uh, to your conductive fibers, and may, maybe uh, incorporate a core fiber here so that uh, the desired stability is achieved. Uh, there are also other properties that you may desire from these uh, fibers. You can have optical fibers in clothing that may be used both for um, it's a fashion uh, items or sensing. You can actually use all sorts of, uh, uh, you can perform all sorts of sensing functions based on optical fibers. Uh, organic semiconductors are also used. The uh, goal here is to uh, perform some of the local signal processing and in analog or digital domains on textile. Uh, the major issue here is durability, but uh, there's a lot of active research going on in this area. Shape memory materials are used to uh, give some sort of a smart uh, response to, to textile. Uh, so for example, the textile becomes uh, let's say water repellent if it is placed inside the moist environment and then goes back to the original condition once the moisture in the environment is reduced. Or uh, cotton, for example, is a natural fiber that can be considered as a shape memory material. Uh, cotton expands when you have uh, increased humidity in the environment, but then shrinks once the humidity 
is removed from the environment. And these materials have a lot of use in textile industry from a long, long time ago, obviously. And then you have chromic materials, and these are materials whose color changes in response to some uh, stimuli. It could be a chemical stimuli, thermal stimuli, or maybe an electrical signal that uh, commands a change in color to a corner of this small textile. So the next uh, challenge or issue when you have the uh, desired properties from the uh, threads that you want to incorporate into the textile is that how to actually do the incorporation. And uh, you can uh, weave these threads into the piece of textile as shown here. This is the traditional way of making textile. Uh, you can use kneading techniques where you create these loops and uh, uh, essentially uh, create a piece of textile out of these uh, interconnection of the loops. Uh, embroidery is one of the more convenient ways of uh, creating uh, uh, these desired patterns on textile where you take a needle and then just uh, sew whatever pattern you want into textile. And then finally, there are coding and printing techniques that you create a uh, ink of the material with desired properties, and then you just print it onto the piece of textile to give it the desired uh, response. So conversion of information or energy between different domains is done through different methods with smart textiles uh, or smart fibers that are used to make smart textiles. On the sensing side, the most common technique is to use some sort of a resistive response in, uh, uh, in, let's say, coordination with whatever stimuli that you're considering. So this could be piezo-resistive response where the resistance changes with uh, applied strain. It could be a thermal resistive response where the resistance changes in, in response to change temperature. But the same thing can be, uh, or a similar change in resistance can be uh, also attributed to change in humidity or other effects. Uh, measurement of a change in resistance is easy, and your conductive fibers uh, already give you a piezo resistor and a temperature sensor right away as soon as you make them. And then you can build on that and do other sorts of sensing. Uh, another sensing application is trans or transduction method is piezoelectric transduction where a charge is produced in response to mechanical strain. Uh, again, because of the types of materials that we use in textile industry, this is a uh, usable uh, transduction mechanism in order to detect strains. Uh, for example, natural silk is piezoelectric, but you know, materials like PVDF, uh, synthetic materials like PVDF are also piezoelectric. And you can use this for sensing, but also for energy generation if needed as well. Capacitive and inductive sensing have also been used to detect different phenomena, but because your substrate in this case is not uh, that well behaving, let's say, there's a lot of variation from time to time and it, it interferes from environmental parameters, uh, then um, your capacitive and inductive sensing methods may not really be that repeatable or reliable. And nonetheless, they are more challenging than capacity, than resistive sensing anyway. And uh, for these reasons, they are demonstrated, but not used that often. On the actuation side, you have a few options. Well, the first one that people have been using for a long time is thermal actuation. You use uh, conductive uh, threads for heating and have heated jackets or gloves or socks. Uh, you can have displays based on LEDs or materials that change the color. Uh, you can have electroactive polymers and make uh, clothing, for example, that is responding to an electrical signal so that, for example, you can uh, alert the user to correct their posture. Uh, and then you can have chemical actuators where you can release a scent on demand uh, with these um, fibers. Um, Parameters that are typically measured with uh, smart fibers include temperature, humidity, and strain. These are typically uh, given as soon as you make one of these, uh, for example, uh, fibers or use one of these conductive fibers. Other parameters include light. You can measure all sorts of biological 
uh, signals, including EMG, ECG. These are the electrical signals produced by body, but also um, blood uh, saturation, oxygen saturation levels in blood, and maybe all sorts of chemical analysis, for example, based on the uh, composition of the sweat and other um, materials. Uh, people can have demonstrated the use of uh, textiles for detection of sound, uh, but again, you know, it's a uh, fairly damp, uh, damped environment, high, lots of damping, and then the quality is not really where we would like it to be yet. And now I'd like to quickly talk about the applications of nanotechnology and then especially nanoparticles in smart textiles. Uh, you know, over the past uh, few decades, maybe two, three decades, we've learned a lot about nanoparticles, and we have noticed that there are uh, numerous applications where we can enhance a certain property of a material or even give a new property to a material by combining uh, the right uh, nanoparticle with the right host uh, material. And in the uh, small textile applications, you can use these nanoparticles in order to add a whole lot of functionality, different types of functionality to the uh, fibers and therefore the textile. So some examples include, you know, enhanced conductivity. In this case, uh, I mean electrical conductivity, but thermal conductivity can also be enhanced using uh, uh, the right type of nanoparticles. You can make the textile water repellent. You can add UV protection. Uh, piezoelectricity and piezoresistivity are properties that we can use in making uh, sensors from these uh, fibers. We can have self-cleaning and all sorts of additional properties based on the type of nanoparticle and dimensions and the materials that you use. Uh, so this gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of developing new materials or, or extracting a de desired uh, performance from the fiber that will eventually be incorporated into the textile. Um, Nanoparticles can be used as coatings on the fibers, or they can be embedded inside the fibers. And in other cases, you know, like uh, what we mentioned earlier in the presentation, they can actually be printed on the surface of the textile as form of an ink that we use uh, to print onto the textile. So here are some examples of manufacturing methods here that I so the first one on top A is uh, essentially polymer extrusion. So what you do is that you mix the uh, polymer with the desired nanoparticle and through some heat and uh, mechanical pressure, you create these fibers that later on you collect them and maybe twist them together to create uh, yarns. Uh, case B is an interesting application where a carbon nanotube forest was created through CVD uh, processes, typical uh, manufacturing methods for uh, CNT forests. But then what they did is that they grabbed onto a corner of this forest and started pulling. And just because of the surface tension between the fibers, uh, between the nanotubes, they started to um, be extruded as the, uh, let's say, that corner was pulled further from the uh, substrate and then during this process they also twisted these fibers together and then eventually you could create the thread that is shown in uh, figure C. Uh, and then uh, figure D and E are another interesting application of uh, uh, or way of making this uh, nanoparticle based yarn. In this case they actually have a hot plasma where the uh, uh, nanoparticles were generated and they started pulling the fiber right uh, from uh, the center of that plasma where the reactions were happening. <laughs> this one here shows you uh, one of those extruded uh, polymers which was actually later on coated with a layer of carbon black to give it the conductivity, make it electrically conductive. And this actually functioned quite well, but you know, as you can expect, because the carbon black, because the conductive part is exposed to the elements, the sensing with this part, with this fiber is really not that easy. At the end of the story, many of these techniques uh, produce really thin fibers, uh, and then if you want to use them, you have to use another carrier fiber or core yarn. 
and maybe twisting sensitive fiber around it in order to make it easier to handle and then uh, survive the knitting or uh, embroidery or any of the other techniques that you use to incorporate it into the textile. I'll come back to another manufacturing technique for these nano uh, particle based uh, yarns, uh, which was done in my lab uh, at the end of the presentation. Now, besides the transducers that you may incorporate into your smart textile, um, you in many cases need an energy source. So this energy source could be there to uh, do the activity that you want, the actuation that you want, or to collect the data from the sensor and maybe process it locally or probably communicate it to uh, another system. Uh, so people have been looking at energy generation mechanisms based on textile and developing these textile-based uh, energy harvesters. Uh, there are a good number of uh, options here. You can use a thermoelectric generator, so TNG and TEG with the difference being that TNG here uses nano generators. And these devices base, uh, work based on the temperature gradients and temperature differences. So if you have a temperature gradient, uh, there are materials that can uh, be used in order to convert that temperature gradient into uh, a little bit of electrical energy. There are piezoelectric nano generators, the second uh, kit shown here. And uh, are, you know these devices convert movement into an electrical uh, charge that can then be uh, used by an electrical system to power up uh, or to store the energy and or use it in different applications. You can have biological fuel cells or solar cells as shown here, and you can also have hybrid generators that combine a number of these um, uh, generators to, with each other in order to provide energy. Uh, this is an ongoing research field and there's a lot of opportunities there and uh, obviously there is a significant amount of uh, interest in order to make these uh, systems self-sustained, you know, without relying on batteries or without having to change batteries to, or charge batteries too often. Over the next uh, few minutes, I'm gonna look at the research that is conducted at three different laboratories at, uh, in BC, Canada. It just shows you how intensive the research in this area is around the world. And I'm going to talk about three different perspectives on how to approach this issue of smart textiles at different groups. Uh, this work is done at the microinstrumentation laboratory that is uh, led by Professor Bonnie Gray at SFU. Uh, and uh, her group is uh, actually one of the pioneers in developing uh, uh, materials based on nanocomposites, you know, mixing nanoparticles with different uh, polymer matrices especially, to extract different types of properties from these combinations. Uh, these nanocomposite materials, depending on what you mix, uh, you know, which nanoparticle is mixed with what kind of a host uh, material, uh, exhibit all sorts of interesting properties, uh, ranging from improved conductance, electrical conductance, all the way to uh, magnetic properties. And you can see some of the work in her lab, where the metal layers that are actually uh, quite flexible uh, are developed and uh, patterned such that you can actually even solder components to them and therefore make electronics using that substrate. Now, the technology they developed in the lab, uh, the one that I'm showing you here, is based on a PDMS uh, material. PDMS is a polymer that is fairly inert and uh, I uh, used quite a lot in microfluidic applications because of its transparency and uh, flexibility, and also it is a biocompatible material. And what they do here uh, is shown in this figure, the fabrication process, where they uh, go and put a seed layer down on a layer of PDMS, and through an electroplating process, deposit a fairly thick layer of metal. It could be copper or nickel. Uh, or, or other materials as well, but these are the two that they use more often. Uh, and then what they do is then uh, transfer that uh, pattern metal layer onto a PDMS layer. This is going to be section D or, or uh, part D in this figure here. Uh, they transfer that onto PDMS and then cap it with another layer of PDMS. So what they have is a buried metal layer inside 
or sandwiched between PDMS layers. And, you know, again, uh, this is going to be flexible because of the properties of PDMS. And if you make your metal layer, if you give the metal layer a little bit of a, uh, let's say, bend, if you make it resistant to, to stretching so that it doesn't tear as you stretch it, you can make, for example, strain uh, sensors and other devices based on this technology. So this was the core technology that has been in her lab or they worked in this area for many years. And they have developed all sorts of, you know, uh, structures going from PCBs to uh, various uh, electronic devices and flexible substrates based on this technology. So you could do this on textile as well. What you do is that you make your device on a piece of PDMS that is fairly flexible and then uh, stick that piece of PDMS to textile. So you can create that sensor on textile that is also flexible and doesn't hinder the, uh, let's say, uh, displacements or stretching or movements of your piece of textile. It can be more or less invisible. Now, the good thing about this technology is that because your metal layers are embedded in that polymer layer, they are not exposed to the elements and uh, you have more control over the properties of layers and their responses. Now, then later on what they did is that they took this idea of making these uh, uh, flexible substrates and patterning metal layers onto them and expanded it to making microfluidic systems on textile. And in this case, again, they use PDMS as the host material or ink as it is referred to in here. Uh, they uh, go and uh, start with actually a paper substrate, create structures on that paper structure that is already coated with a layer of ink, and then go and attach these layers of ink or these layers of polymer on top of each other and create a sandwich of these layers. With three of them, you can actually have uh, channels formed that are sealed in between these two, uh, these three uh, layers of uh, polymer. And uh, if you do it right, you can actually uh, place inlets and outlets on these channels and have a fluid go through this structure. Now, this can again be attached to a piece of textile, and in this case, you will have a microfluidic system that is uh, attached to your textile uh, for different applications. Here is a cross section. You can see that you can realize channels whose width are about 100 microns. And notice that there are no fancy materials used here. This is all relatively simple uh, and inexpensive material. You know, the paper, uh, substrate, PDMS, and the material, the process used for uh, patterning these is just a laser cutter. So fairly inexpensive and can be done in many different places. And uh, one advantage of this technology here is that by uh, keeping the fluid within the uh, PDMS layers, you avoid all those challenges that you have with you know fluids and tax by the leakage and wettability and all those things uh, but this uh, material is still thin enough only a couple of hundred micrometers in thickness that is it is very flexible and it bends and reply, uh, responds to uh, whatever that your textile is imposing on it and then they've created different types of uh, devices microfluidic devices based on this technology you know mixers and uh, analyzers and such, and I, I suggest you to uh, refer to the papers and publications for further information. Now, once you have the background to make electronics and then this technology to make uh, microfluidic systems, you can now combine them and you can make electronic slash microfluidic systems uh, essentially on this piece of uh, PDMS but it is flexible enough that you can actually attach it to a piece of textile and use it as part of that textile without really uh, hindering the movements or operation. And through the technologies that I mentioned to you, they can actually create, for example, electrodes. And these are uh, contact points to human body, for example, that you can use to uh, capture EMG or ECG signals. Or you can combine electronics with microfluidic systems. And in this case, for example, you can direct the flow inside the channel or do uh, all sorts of analysis on the uh, fluid that is inside this channel uh, to the extent of the possibilities that you have 
with those uh, technologies. And uh, here is an example of a signal that is collected by the electrodes that they put on, on uh, using, they created using this technology and uh, signals that are captured using the reference electrode, which shows really good uh, results. So the other case studies that I'm going to uh, describe here or briefly mention here is for the biomedical applications of a small textile. Uh, this work is from uh, Dr. Mohsen Akbari's group at the University of Victoria, uh, Lyme Lab, and uh, he has done a lot of work on developing all sorts of biomedical uh, devices and systems. And in this case, the one that actually I want to show here is the fabrication method they have in order to create their sensitive fibers. They use these fibers uh, for various uh, stress and even chemical sensing applications, and I'll show you some examples later on. But uh, particularly in this case, I want to show you their fabrication method that shows uh, how you can make these sensitive fibers. So what they start with is a, a spool of cotton thread. This is uh, the top of the page, uh, let's say part A of the figure. And they pass this uh, fiber or this uh, cotton yarn through a plasma. This activates the surface of that cotton fiber. Then they pass it through some carbon nanotube based ink so that CNT will go and stick to the surface of the fiber. And after, um, annealing this process and maybe uh, uh, shielding it or, or coating it with another protection layer, you finally have your um, react or your sensitive fiber. And then here in part J of this figure, you actually see the fiber with the, this is a regular cotton fiber, but it has been coated with the desired nanoparticle in the, uh, through the method that was described here. And in this work, they actually used it for a temperature sensor. But as mentioned before, you know, once you have a resistor, you have a temperature sensor, you have a strain sensor, and you most likely have a humidity sensor as well. And actually, the challenge would be to uh, distinguish these from each other, these different effects from each other. Now, one of the other interesting work in his lab is on developing these uh, smart wound dressings. And these are, again, smart textiles. What they do is that they create these hydrogels uh, and uh, incorporate pH sensitive material in these hydrogels. Uh, and then they create fibers or, or yarn from these hydrogels. And uh, then these uh, fibers, each one of them is uh, made with slightly different material so that when they are exposed to different pH levels, each one will have or will exhibit a different color. And by making a dressing, a wound dressing out of these materials, uh, what you can do is that you can see how the wound heals over time. Because as the wound heals, as the healing process goes forward, the pH level of the environment next to the wound uh, will change. And a, an experienced nurse or, or a doctor can look at this and right away from the color of this uh, dressing, they can estimate the pH levels at the location of the wound and then uh, evaluate the healing process. Uh, so this is one of those applications of uh, chromic materials in smart textile. And as you can see that uh, the smart textile in this case is changing color in response to a chemical input, which is the pH level at the location of the wound. Uh, the uh, fibers are produced in a system like this. These are coaxial fibers and uh, made of hydrogels. They mix these materials inside a very simple system using a very simple microfluidic nozzle. And they collect the fibers in a CaCl2 solution and then uh, incorporate it into the uh, smart dressings. And uh, finally, this is another work again from Dr. Akbari's group where they uh, incorporated strain sensitive uh, fibers in dressings uh, so that they could actually monitor the strains and stresses uh, around the wound, also the temperature and humidity. And in this case, they developed an, uh, a, a wireless transmitter uh, next to the wound so that the 
condition of the wound can actually be monitored remotely. Uh, if you are interested in more work or more details about these two projects from Dr. Uh, Bonnie Gray or Dr. Mohsen Akbari, I strongly suggest that you just uh, search their names with the university and they will come up and then have a look at their publications and all the activities that are going on in their labs. Finally, uh, the last case study that I wanted to talk about is about the work in my research group where we are developing these nanofibrous uh, threads for smart textile applications. Uh, so the technique that we are using here is based on electrospinning. In electrospinning, you take a polymer, put it inside a syringe, and apply a very large electric field between the needle that is connected to that syringe and the collector. The electric field extracts the polymer through the syringe, and then as the polymer extracts, the, it leaves the syringe. Uh, it is charged. We have a very large electric volt uh, potential between the two. The charge uh, on these polymers that are usually not conductive uh, causes different bits and pieces of the polymer to repel each other, and then you create these nanofibers that eventually you collect on the collector. Parameters here are uh, the flow rate, the voltage that you apply between the syringe and the collector, uh, and the distance between the collector and the syringe. Uh, now, doing this, you can get actually very interesting materials, many nanofibrous uh, materials that have a lot of surface area, and a lot of people have looked at them for chemical sensing applications. Uh, what we did here is that we added another pump and another a polymer use a, a coaxial needle. Uh, we could actually create a, a, a polymers that have a core and a shell. So we basically extracted both polymers at about the same rate from two different syringes using this uh, electric field. And by having a, a shell around the core, you can actually protect the core from the environment. You can create it, it you create these coaxial fibers or coaxial nanofibers as shown here, where the center of these fibers or, or these nanofibers is to, to a great extent shielded from the environment. So if your center or the core of these fibers is conductive and the sh uh, shell or the outer layer is insulating, you essentially have a coaxial uh, nanofiber here and when you're doing measurements, you know, small changes in moisture or humidity in the, in, the, in the environment are not going to affect the conductance uh, through the core of this material that strongly. Now, and then as you can see, if you use, uh, for example, carbon nanotubes for the core layer, we can incorporate carbon nanotubes in this, let's say, bottom syringe here into the polymer that comes out of it and use pure polymer for the outer layer. And you can see here in these two PEM images that you have nanofibers, uh, nano uh, tubes in the center of the fiber and then basically pure material around them. Now, this is very good and nice, but the challenge is that through the electrospinning process, the basic electrospinning process that I've shown here, you collect these mats of uh, randomly oriented fibers in all directions. So the next thing that we wanted to do was uh, two things. First of all, as you notice, the diameter of these fibers is really small. We're talking about hundreds of nanometers in diameter, so therefore they are not really easy to handle. And the second thing is that we wanted to orient them and basically create a yarn out of these coaxial fibers. Uh, so here is the, uh, let's say, Modification we did to the basic electrospinning system. Uh, what we did is that in between the syringe and the collector, uh, we uh, placed three electrodes that created a rotating electric field. And as the fibers uh, pass through this region between these three electrodes, uh, and recalling that these fibers are charged particles, they are going to respond to the electric field that is uh, rotating in this region. And what that does is that it actually starts to twist these nanofibers to each, to each other as they go through this region. We then, instead of using a regular collector, we use the drum that is spinning at a predetermined rate. 
And what it does is that it just collects these fibers and pulls them and actually through this way, you create a very long uh, fiber instead of a mat of these uh, nanoparticles. So here is a uh, clip or video clip of the process. We have these three electrodes where in the rotating electric field uh, exists and then that electric field twist is charged nanofibers with each other and you collect the re resulting uh, uh, twisted yarns on a drum so depending on the frequency of the electric field you can have you know few twists per 100 micrometers to and maybe only a couple of nanofibers to uh, at this straight here you're basically rotating the field at about 300 hertz uh, and you can see that you're getting uh, fairly substantial twisting between these nanofibers and you're getting to dimensions that are now uh, fairly easy for humans or machines to pick up these fibers and use them. And then if you twist some of these fibers together, you get a fairly uh, um, thick fiber that you can easily use in uh, textile applications. So we took these fibers and we incorporated them into uh, file textiles. Uh, before that, we started doing some, uh, let's say, strain resistivity or uh, experiments or piezo resistivity experiments to look at the response of these uh, fibers to strain. And uh, here's the experiment or the setup, fairly basic. And one of the interesting uh, findings here was that when we have these twisted nanofibers, so we could have straight nanofibers, just collect them on the drum without the field, or we can twist them and then collect them on the, uh, on the drum. And we noticed a few things, that when you twist them, for example, one of the advantages or unexpected advantages was that the um, fibers break at much higher strains, actually, compared to uh, fibers that were made of uh, just uh, straight uh, nanofibers without twisting. Uh, so that's shown in figure A. The device shows some hysteresis uh, but, uh, and some nonlinearity in its response, uh, but uh, it's reversible nonetheless. And uh, you can see that the electrical resistivity and strain are also uh, proportional to each other. Um, now, the concluding remarks here. Uh, you know, the past few years have been very exciting. There was a lot of investigation and discoveries in this area, but now things are settling in. You know, the applications or the methods that are uh, better suited for production are slowly uh, rising to the top, and people are made. There is a lot of companies that are making uh, products based on small textiles. Uh, so these are still early phases and, you know, it is expected that in three to four years, things will become mature. Some of these companies will uh, again rise above the others or there will be some mergers and uh, collaborations between them. And uh, you, the customers will see more and more products based on smart textiles in the market. Uh, the challenges that are remaining is, number one, the high cost of these materials at this moment. Uh, I showed you some examples earlier on in the presentation. The hexoskin jacket that was produced uh, by the Canadian company cost about $500 US. And uh, my inter products are not that much cheaper. And for real mainstream applications of these devices, we need to uh, reduce the cost of them. Uh, we would like to integrate more electronics into these textiles instead of you know relying on silicon chips and other components we would like to do as much as we can with the textile there is still research to be done in that area uh, we would like to improve the durability and a lot of these materials that are currently on the market need special treatment right so if you uh, for example some of them have to be dried in dryer you cannot just hang them for drying, and then some other ones are sensitive to the high temperatures in the dryer. So we need to improve the durability and repeatability between these sensors. We need to make sure that you know the data that comes from the sensors you have on these textiles is more reliable so that your signal processing algorithms can do more. And one uh, other item that I would like to bring to your attention, it's not discussed that much nowadays, partly because there is not really 
a huge market yet, but it's the issue of recycling these uh, smart textiles. We are introducing all sorts of uh, advanced materials and smart materials here, and there's a chance that some of them may not be easy to recycle. And uh, if you have electronic components or batteries, that's another piece of uh, component to, to waste, and we would like to minimize that uh, when possible. This is the last slide. I would like to thank you for sitting through this presentation and talk. Uh, and if you have questions, feel free to contact me through these methods I mentioned here. Thank you.